it's the 18th of December. We've been lost in the mountains now for two hours. Can't, I can't even remember the taste of bread because I only have mini croissants to eat. Mm. But seriously though, look at this. It's not like we can see far. <laughs> I I'm, guess I'm, I'm grateful that uh, there's plenty of dew outside in Norway, even though we're in lockdown still. Another year gone. In 2020, I have seen a surge of subscribers on YouTube, but still only a small percentage of the people that watch my videos are actually subscribed. So, if you like this video, please consider subscribing. It's free, you could always unsubscribe. What does it mean to be a PhD student in Norway? Much of the English speaking uh, world, or at least North America, it is common if you want to continue on to do a PhD to enroll at graduate school immediately after you've done an undergraduate degree, like a bachelor's degree. And then you take some courses and uh, hopefully you're able to make ends meet by by doing a teaching assistantship or a research assistantship or something like that and then eventually graduate if you're able to do some original research along the way. I finished my master's degree in September a year ago and uh, especially in the US it's not common to get a master's degree unless you uh, jump off graduate school before you're actually done with your PhD. But uh, in Europe, at least, here we follow the, the Bologna process, which means that we have three stages of higher education. Uh, first, bachelor's degree, then master's degree, and then we are at uh, the PhD level. I did not enroll in the program immediately. I actually applied for a job at a research group here at the University of Oslo. So my position here was fully funded by the Department of Digitalization and Education, or something like that. Then. I'm not actually sure what it's called. And it had a more or less clear goal. It has a, had a job description, right? So the normal amount to complete the PhD here in Norway is three years. I have a year extra, so I have four. But 25% uh, of my time is dedicated to, to teaching, which I'm, I'm fine with. It gives me a bit more flexibility. So in addition to doing research or what's part of my, my job description, uh, and teaching, I also have to take a few courses to get the degree of a PhD. Uh, but uh, I can more or less pick those courses myself, as long as I argue that they fit into my degree somehow, and they need to be approved by some council. I, I don't know who those guys are, but yeah, that's, that's the rule anyway. Let me try to tell you a little bit about what I am supposed to be doing in my PhD. So if you have been able to find my LinkedIn profile, you will see that I am doing a PhD in learning analytics and machine learning, which is true in a, in a manner of speaking, but it doesn't really say much, right? It could, could be almost anything. So I am actually doing a PhD in physics education research or PER as us initiates called it. So PER has historically been focused on building surveys to, to measure learning in physics. Uh, I guess that someday some professor thought that our student actually learning what I'm trying to teach them. And the answer turned out to be maybe. It's, it's very difficult to measure learning, right? It's called psychometrics. You try to divine some sort of knowledge or so you're trying to, to really read people's minds, right? Through a, through a test and it, that's impossible. You know, it, if we were allowed to, you know, put electrodes into the brain of a human being, which we're not, then maybe we would be able to measure learning precisely. Or if we were able to do that, like uh, Elon Musk's Neuralink are trying to do now with, you know, this human machine interaction thing, Neuralink. Then, then maybe we will be, but uh, right now how we measure learning is through a what we call a psychometric assessment tool, right? Some sort of standardized test that hopefully yeah, measures what we wanted to do, but it doesn't always. More recently, professors around the world and also here in Oslo uh, have figured out that in order for a physicist in today's world to be successful after graduation 
or in academia for that matter, they need to be able to do computer programming. So professors have been starting to integrate what we call computation, uh, and that is to visualize or to solve or simulate any type of physical problem on a computer. And this is a process that's been going on for a few years or some time. And eventually I think that every physics student will need to learn programming uh, during their degree. Uh, but because this is a new thing, people are doing it different ways. Uh, it's sort of my job to develop this sort of psychometric assessment tool to measure the learning gained from integrated computations or programming in physics curricula. If successful, it will be incredibly useful. I wanted to talk a little bit about what I have done in my PhD so far. All right. So in the beginning, when I started on uh, on this job, I uh, I wrote a piece of paper. You know, so a research goal. Uh, it was about five pages or something with you know milestones. I want to do this and that and this and that. And this was even before I I knew anything about learning or or PER at all. So I haven't followed that plan too closely, but I don't think that's common at all, really. So 2020 for me started with a blast. Early in the spring I went to, to MSU, Michigan State University, uh, and visited their uh, the physics education research laboratory that they have there. It's a, it's a big physics education research uh, group. I learned a lot from them. I built a model with some data that they, they have there at uh, MSU. And uh, I, I sort of proved that uh, what professors you take in introductory physics courses has a great effect and significant effect on your performance in that uh, course, which was interesting because uh, I, I showed that this effect was much larger than ethnicity effects or gender effects that, that many people are very concerned about, which they should be of course, but it, it's interesting to see that a professor you have can have a larger effect than any of these other effects. I've said the word effects a lot of times now. Those re results were sort of interesting, but not really uh, novel or revolutionary in any way. I, I typed up a uh, proceedings article and sent it to uh, a conference, but uh, yeah, it was rejected, which was a big shock because, as I said, not too novel or revolutionary. Not too long after I returned home to Oslo here in Norway, after my, my stay at MSU, the global pandemic was a matter of fact. Why are we still here? Just to suffer. Uh, anyways, I, I found working from home by myself to be, uh, to be honest, very, very difficult. Uh, it was I, I, I struggled to, to motivate myself and after some time I was completely fed up with, uh, with Covid and the entire pandemic. Everybody was talking on it, about it, it was everywhere in the news. What Covid did uh, for me was uh, lift my, my YouTube channel to, to, to new and wondrous heights because I think in 2020, my, three of my top five videos were something related to disease models or COVID directly. I actually made my SIR disease model uh, the year before, in June 2019, before COVID was a fact, which is a bit interesting. So maybe I knew for legal reasons, that's a joke. So even though I had several requests like fitting uh, a disease model to actual data and so on and I, I sort of wanted to do it, I was so fed up with the whole COVID situation that I, uh, I, I had trouble enough trying to do my you know, normal job, which wasn't normal at all anymore. Because I, when you cannot go to work and, and talk to you know, colleagues and discuss issues, and I was very new to this, this field of education research, right? It, is, it became, well, difficult. I think the one bright spot during the spring semester for me was that I was involved in teaching an introductory course on, on quantum mechanics. It was all digital on Zoom, of course, but it was so nice uh, and very rewarding to actually interact with students. And, and I had this special discussion group that I was responsible for where we discussed interpretations of quantum mechanics. And this was the first course that those students had on quantum mechanics, which was very interesting. And also theory, and we talked about the history and the need for a new theory, why classical theories failed, and, and that, was, that was just great. great. I, I love that. So that was sort of my, the highlight of the week was uh, talking you know, to students, well actually talking, talking to someone. Well, apart from all that, I, 
did manage to complete a mandatory course on research ethics that, that all PhD students in Norway ha has to do. Then, after a nice summer break, which I spent in Lofoten, climbing and surfing, most of the employees were allowed uh, back, so I allowed back to my office and I, my uh, Covid depression blew away, so to say. So I managed to do a lot this fall semester. I took two courses. One on agent-based uh, modeling and game theory and evolutionary uh, dynamics. It was a very interesting course, I absolutely loved it. I also, I also did a project-based AI course where me and a, a couple of other dudes, we, we built an AI that uh, can compose uh, music. And that sounds incredibly cool, but that course was actually a lot of work. <laughs> the joy of the course sort of... Um, disappeared in the workload for for me at least but uh, yeah it was it was interesting and also and also during the uh, the fall semester uh, I, I managed to to get a good start on my main PhD project so right now I'm about to finish stage one of uh, my assessment development which has been to um, explore experts opinions and perspectives so that is I've actually conducted a bunch of interviews uh, with uh, with professors, uh, mostly in uh, in North America, about how uh, they integrate computational programming in physics courses, why they do it, and what they focus on, and and so on, to sort of see okay, what's what's important. So right now I have interviewed around twenty, well almost twenty percent professors, and how they integrate uh, programming in their their teaching, uh, which is pretty cool. And these people have also been a joy to talk to. Uh, they've been really nice and friendly uh, because this uh, this task before I begun it, it, it seemed a bit daunting, you know, to try to well actually first send out emails to a bunch of people asking, "Hello, I am sitting here in Norway and I want to interview about how you do stuff." And yeah, and it, it's been a, a nice experience. And to some extent re related to this project, I am involved with another project where we are trying to show that students have a larger degree of epistemic uh, agency when they are doing an open-ended project and are allowed to uh, simulate and visualize and you know use a computer and programming and all that. Uh, epistemic agency is when students or anyone really take responsibility and control over their own learning efforts. Uh, so we have been trying to give these open-ended projects in electromagnetism this fall and also the year before and the year before that, I think. What we see is because we teach students how to program from early on, they are able to do a lot with that. And they're saying themselves that they, weren't, they wouldn't be able to do everything that they achieve without knowing a bit of Python programming, which is really cool. And, and the projects that they write or the, um, the essays are, are just wonderful. So that's been very interesting. So what else have I done? I've also been involved with teaching a course on computational physics, of course. In, uh, in this course it's project-based with five projects and uh, I actually also... I was allowed to create an optional fifth project for this course, which was on the Black-Scholes model, which is a, uh, a very important model in finance used to compute the price of stock options. And on the face of it, that doesn't really appear to be even remotely related to physics, but uh, it is, trust me. And I am planning to do a video on that, so stay tuned, subscribe, leave a like if you want to hear more. And I also think that I should mention that I have been involved with supervising or co-supervising a couple of master students with their master's projects. Uh, one of them finished uh, this fall, uh, and I have uh, I am co-supervising two other students right now on some really cool projects, uh, and that has been uh, nothing but an honor and uh, complete joy and pleasure. So there we have it. Making this video has been uh, a very very beneficial to me because it has allowed me to sort of look back and all the things I've done, and I have have even though I haven't really. Uh, published anything or have any you know real evidence of achievement. I have I feel like I've done a lot uh, This past year or for my first year as a PhD student It's been a learning experience for me to, to sort of go through what I've been doing for the past year So for the future who knows nobody knows what the future holds But I, I'm planning to do a video uh, or a series of videos on the heat equation or the diffusion equation and also the wave equation, probably. There are a few of these important equations in physics. And I want to do a video on finance and how that is connected to, to physics, which is a very interesting topic because I actually have a master's degree in finance, if you didn't know. 
I actually did a talk on that this semester for, for teachers. The continuing education of teachers in, in Oslo. I think it might be interesting for people to know what I've actually been up to and that the, the videos on YouTube will continue coming. So <laughs> stay tuned for that. 